Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session uh, by Lloyd Smith is Affordable Remote Imaging Has Come of Age. And uh, Lloyd's in the room with Bruce, uh, I didn't catch his last name, but um, they are going to give a great presentation on, uh, well, exactly that. But before we go into that, I do want to show off our image of the week. And unfortunately, well, you know Tolga, but he has not been able to get into the room. Uh, if he does pop into the room later in the show, uh, I'll definitely give him an opportunity to speak about this. But he has imaged the Soap Bubble Nebula. And I was surprised when this popped up because I was working on the same target in probably similar skies. Maybe he's a little bit better, but either way. And I was amazed by his uh, uh, image of this. Uh, th this wasn't taken from skies like uh, we're going to hear about tonight. This was taken from uh, New Jersey. So, uh, very difficult target, and uh, I'm pretty impressed with that. Um, I, if anyone knows any of the further details about this is equipment, I forget what he was working with on this. They're welcome to share it, but otherwise we'll give Tolga an opportunity if he does pop into the room later in the show. Uh, but as of right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it right over to Lloyd, and uh, he can take it away. Hey, Adam, thanks a lot. Hope everybody can hear me fine. Um, start with a quick introduction. My name is Lloyd Smith, and um, I'm one of, the, one of the two founders of Deep Sky West Remote Observatory, along with Bruce Wright. I'll give him a chance to say a couple of words. Um, yeah, by day, I'm a partner with PwC uh, doing advisory for healthcare, and by night, I am uh, Working uh, a little bit sleep deprived these days, but by night uh, we operate Deep Sky West Remote Observatory. And Bruce, take uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, similar background to Lloyd. My name is Bruce Wright. I'm a managing director of Grant Thornton and Business Advisory Services. Uh, the same thing as Lloyd. During the day, I uh, do consulting work, and then when I'm uh, on site, I'm a uh, I've branded myself as a star farmer now. So. That's the land in New Mexico uh, was building a uh, an energy efficient off grid house, and uh, Lloyd convinced me to spend all of my money building a new uh, observatory. So now I'm a star farmer. <laughs> hey, so uh, I'm going to start a uh, thanks, Bruce. I'm going to Bruce will chime in every so often uh, as we go through this. I'm going to start in on a presentation which is uh, not exceedingly long, uh, but. I would like for anyone who has questions about any aspect of this to ask away at any time. Uh, Adam, can you confirm you see the opening slide? Yes, I do see the opening slide. And for all of you that want to ask questions out there uh, that are new, uh, there's something called Q&A. If you hover over the top right of your screen, you'll see something that says Q&A. Click that, and you'll be able to ask questions, and we'll see them. We'll call them out to Lloyd. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So. Uh, we're going to start this actually kind of building up the case for why we think remote imaging makes sense, and not just for a few, but for, for lots of people. And uh, we think that we've found at least one of the good ways to do that. So as I went through my list of things that I would like to have as an imager, of course, we, you know, we want subarctic seeing. Uh, we want great, dark, and transparent skies, and we want them in abundance. Uh, and then on the kind of a different side of that, we want you know, high-speed networks to carry our data, power that's reliable. Uh, a lot of these remote observatories are just that. They're remote. So that's a very remote area. So reliable infrastructure, power being one, is critical. Uh, and, of course, you want a suitable enclosure. You want the thing to be highly automated with great equipment and to be safe and secure. But if you look at this list, you know, by my reckoning, those first four things are Mother Nature. Mother Nature decides whether or not you have that. Maybe you're fortunate, like Bruce, to live in an off-grid house, and you actually live in one of these places. But um, those guys are just not abundantly available uh, to everyone. So the other things you can buy, the first four things you, you cannot get, you cannot buy. So the good news is the technology is there. I, I think we all, I don't know what the levels of automation are uh, in use by everyone, but I know when I started imaging, I read lots. And I read lots of things that said, start old school and work your way up. And I read about old school and, and, and about people taking turns on an illuminated reticle eyepiece and freezing. And so to me, old school sounded pretty bad. I did not want to do it. 
the warning was, you're going to have this crazy learning curve. And I said, okay, I'm a pretty smart guy. I can do that. But if you, if you do it smartly, I believe, uh, for those who haven't really gone down that path, there's ways to do it, you know, kind of piecemeal, but not old, old school, just sort of slow school, if you will, if you will. Start with your, get your plate solving down, or get your guiding down before you start trying to combine things under, underneath the control of an executive program of some sort. But the technology is there, and it's doable. Um, I never spent one night doing a, a manual meridian flip. I know how, but why when we don't have to? But here's the bad news. We've seen various versions of this chart, and this is the sad truth. And, um, you know, the chart on the left has been around for a while, but it just shows this steady progression of light predominantly from east to west in the United States. And, and uh, you know, continental Europe is really in a bad way. Now, if you can find yourself in one of these dark spots, you know, say down, down in the southwest, uh, that would be good or over, you know, across the ocean in northern Africa, that would be good. But by and large, those places are missing some critical aspect of infrastructure. So this is not exclusively, but somewhat. So this is, this is a depiction of the really bad news. So when you add that together, this is, this is not a, a serious financial analysis. Uh, my clients wouldn't accept this as a, a means to uh, decide to buy or sell a company. But what it does say, and what it tries to depict is take your average imaging, imaging system, moderate to high end. I'm going to assume that's about 20K. What the chart says on the far left, if you want to put it in economic terms, and, and I know a fellow who, who had some, a very similar situation. Uh, I bought a scope from him. But, you know, if you can crank out 50 clear nights a year, which I think is really, really low, I can do that better than that here in Georgia. Uh, but if you can crank out 50 nights a year, you're effectively paying $400 a night imaging with that system, at least in its first year. You can spread that out over multiple years. But I know a fellow who had, a, you know, and this is not an uncommon situation, uh, a high, high-end system, you know, over over $45,000. And, and he used it 18 to 20 times a year, partially because he had not the weather, partially because he had not the time. And uh, over time, those things compounded, and he you know, ultimately lost the desire. And it's really, uh, it is not putting your time and talents and skills to their highest and best use, is what that amounted to. So, uh, again, that scope found itself under a sheet in the garage and eventually in our possession, but that's a different story. So. You know, what are really the major impediments? That's kind of an open question to ask yourself. What are the major impediments to creating great images? Is it your equipment? I think the equipment and technology are there, but high end to, to low end, you can still make great images. Is it the skies and the environment? Is it your time or is it your processing ability? And I would say that, you know, there, there are a handful of images, and we, and we know of most of them that make something wonderful out of less than stellar data. Uh, but those folks are in the minority. You know, if you had your druthers, you'd go back to that wish list. Great equipment, a great sky, and plenty of time to do it. And you can make highest and best use of your equipment. So I say it another way. Uh, for, for those of us, I'm sure everyone with their Enzo, you know, would you want to have that thing on a dirt road? Which would probably be a blast at first for a while, but, you know, put to its highest and best use is in the proper environment with the proper skills, and one day you end up like this guy. So that's my uh, racing analogy for any, any one of the Taposi who's out there. Make sense? Any questions? I haven't seen any questions pop across yet. I see a lot of viewers, though, in our room, so I want to remind you uh, now Q&A, type your questions in there, and we'll call them right out to Lloyd. Fantastic. So, so we, um, we started out, this is the actual snip of a spreadsheet that, that we built two years ago, uh, just over two years ago. And these were the criteria that we thought were important. Every column represents a potential site for what later became uh, ESW. And you know, this is kind of your typical consultant heat map. 
the one thing that strikes me as I look back at the criteria as we laid them down over two years ago is the very first one was how close is it to where Lloyd is right now. And I was concerned whether or not I could drive there or did I have to fly there if I had to drive, you know, for how long. And looking back at this, and, and I have since, since today, obviously, but that, that first criteria really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What we're trying to overcome is all that light pollution and other things that happen predominantly in the east and not so much in the west. And, and when, as I set out, I was caught up in what I'll sort of some sort of old school thinking. I wanted to be close to it. And the overriding factor is, is can you get it to the best skies and have all the other things? So location, location, location. Can you build something that makes sense? Do you have the infrastructure to go with it? And so forth. But this is how we looked at it then. Uh, we've since, obviously, Chartoon. So another view of where are all the good skies. You know, we landed on that last circle, I should say, the New Mexico column. I went to visit Bruce, who's a landowner at Deep Sky West. A, he lives on top of a mesa, 7,500 feet. It's 12 miles from the interstate. The exit that you take off the interstate is 60, uh, it's 48 kilometers from Santa Fe, uh, which is an important number, and it's 96 kilometers from Albuquerque. Once you get to the top of the mesa, you drive 11 miles into the middle of nowhere. So there's 220,000 acres with 19 people who live there. And I don't know how many tens of thousands of head of cattle. So we, you know, it was pretty obvious to us that we needed to go go west. And uh, the site, as I visited over New Year's Eve that year, was perfect for us. So this is a close-in view of that. And I, I mentioned a minute ago, and I'll locate Deep Sky West for you. I mentioned a couple minutes ago uh, the distance from from the two major urban populations there, uh, 48 kilometers from Santa Fe. This population figure of, of 69,000 people, I believe that is actually the city proper, probably many more than that, but uh, not likely a factor of 10. But we are 48, 48 kilometers from there, and by most estimates, if you're about 20, 20 clicks from uh, a major metropolitan area, you are you know, somewhat less affected, if not completely out of the light dome. We're 60 miles from Albuquerque. Having spent tons of time at the site and knowing the intervening um, topography, there, there is no hint of a light dome in any direction, especially those two. Yeah, Lloyd, one point. This is Bruce. Uh, one point to uh, point out there also. We have major mountain range between Albuquerque and Deep Sky West and Santa Fe and Deep Sky West. Any any light that uh, would have potentially caused a problem is, is, as Lloyd pointed out, completely obscured. And the good news, too, about those is Sandia Peak, for example, over near, near Albuquerque, it's it's about 60 miles from us. And, you know, we, we would love to have, you know, coastal laminar flow that's been going on for, you know, thousands of miles or something like that. That's just not the fact of life in too many places in the continental U.S. So good news is we have intervening topography. Good news also is that it's far enough away so as not to cause us um, any significant uh, seeing aberrations. So that's that's a good thing. And in these other areas, other thing I should mention too, there are some places in and around us that are uh, darker, uh, more desirable in many respects, uh, but they are. There's good news and bad news. The good news is there's uh, Pecos National Forest is all around us. So that gets a, a plus mark for durability, meaning the potential for encroachment due to urban straw, uh, sprawl or any other kind of urban urbanization is near zero. Uh, there will be no spreading of Santa Fe to us, and Albuquerque is just too far away. Uh, the other thing about these zones that are incredibly dark and remote is just that's where the remote kicks in. We have reliable electricity. We have fiber optics that's reliable. You go um, another 10 or so miles due east, you start heading far from it. You start heading toward El Paso. 
and you go down the, the mesa gradually, and you end up in a place where there's just no infrastructure and hardly any hope of getting it. So we found those good skies over there. Now, let me localize you even a little bit more by zooming in <clears throat> to exactly what the site looks like. And we have another view that we can share with you that will give you even more information. So that's that marks almost exactly the spot where the observatory is located. And you're seeing all but the forward, say, about quarter of the uh, plot of land there. And in the center is the residence, fully functional. Uh, when we've had folks come out to do installations, they, they stay in the house uh, with Bruce, with us if I'm there, um, free of charge. It's got running water, food, and entertainment, and the squirrel that lives on the front porch. This house, by the way, is nearly 75% underground. It's pretty interesting. So that's where we are, <clears throat> where we're located. So once we decided what, where, we had to decide what to build. And by no disrespect intended to whoever did this, but I think I've probably been guilty of something similar. You know, when I'm in my backyard, you know, I put a I used some kind of tarp, but you know, you have to cover protect your equipment. We knew we obviously couldn't build anything like that, nor could we build any of these really for our purposes. You know, a roll off, um, a small roll off is good for one scope, maybe two if it's a little bigger, or maybe a piggyback situation. But for, for our thinking, which initially was Lloyd's going to put a dome at, at, at what is now Deep Sky West, I wanted a little more flexibility and a little more room. You know, a dome on the house, that's pretty cool. A dome on the slab, a dome down you know, wherever that is, those, that would be awesome, but out of reach. You know, you have a whole multitude of different designs to choose from. We initially um, decided on a, a fairly unique design that we were calling the, the gravity assist roll-off roof, which essentially would have shut in, in the case of totally catastrophic failure, um, I mean, a complete meltdown the observatory would have shut on its own due to gravity. But by the time we got to the final size of the building, that, that became not an option. But we went through a multitude of different designs. And finally, as you see in this picture, I had a conversation with Dave Drasovich, and I said, you know, here's what we're doing. What are your ideas? Because I've seen what you've built down in Chile in collaboration with a few other people. And he sent me this design, and I liked it just fine. I thought, you know, that's starting to look a little bit more like what we are thinking about, um, albeit on on a smaller scale. And and I particularly liked like this view because essentially you have a roll off building observatory. So there in the southern hemisphere, that's actually a southerly view. I I would assume in that scope is in its part, but pointed south. The things we looked at when we looked at this, we thought, okay, first we have a size issue because we want to house more than one instrument. Secondly, the orientation, which in this case looks to be north and south, um, to our way of thinking, the line of sight that is most sought after that is harder to get is to the south. So we aren't oriented the building along the opposite axis of this. And I'll show you um, in a second. So when we went through our checklist after we figured out our design, we thought for sure we have the location. We have lots of astrometric nights. We have solid infrastructure. Uh, we have on-site support in the form of what I'll call really 1.75 FTEs. Um, we have security. The entire property is fenced and locked. Excuse me. And we have some electronic uh, countermeasures as well. And you know we picked a, a pretty good structure. Um, I'll let Bruce talk a little bit about this point about local contractors because, you know, we had to move tons of concrete and steel to find all sorts of craftsmen. And his experience up here building the uh, residence came, uh, was invaluable during that time. Yeah, I'll go over a couple of things, and then we've got a, a slide and a couple of uh, a couple of future slides that uh, I can show you some pictures and give you some some better detail, but. Uh, I, I can't overemphasize this enough, whether you're doing it in your backyard or you're trying to do something like this. 
having the expertise uh, readily available is invaluable. Um, I had to have electricians, obviously, for the, the complexity of the wiring. We have the uh, infrastructure for our, our fiber. Um, and, and another uh, huge, uh, valuable resource that I found was a guy who was a fabricator, a metal fabricator. And this will become a little more clear when we show you the next pictures. We literally built this thing on miniature railroad tracks. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the guy was instrumental on the design of that to carry the weight load. And uh, back to the picture that we were looking at in Chile, when we started looking at the truss structure, what we would need to support this, um, it, it looked very much like what we were looking at from the, a building perspective of some of the Quonset huts we had looked at. Um, yeah, you can see the truss structure inside there. So I got in touch with a steel uh, manufacturing building, a uh, building manufacturing outfit, told, gave them our location, and they did uh, engineering studies on snow load, wind, rain, that type of thing, and came back, and, and we took, gave them the dimensions of scopes and things like that we would need, and they came back with a uh, recommendation on a specific building, um, and then, uh, again, as you'll see in a few slides, we were able to customize that design uh, to make it fit what we, what we were looking for. So, um, and I have recently talked to a, a gentleman that I've met just outside of Santa Fe who's trying to do a couple of domes in his backyard and is, is running into these same kind of problems. He said, you know, just breaking ground to get the, uh, the footers in that rock out there is incredible. So um, I, I'm going to stop now. I want to ask for any questions. And then I'd like to pick this up in, in a couple of uh, slides where we've got some, uh, some build pictures of the site. And uh, I'll give you a little more detail on it at that point. Yeah. So here you go. Ah, there we go. There you go. <laughs> So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, that's, uh, that's our first couple of, uh, of sections of the Quonset hut. So you can look at the, it's a 13-foot peak from the floor of the observatory to the top. And we have over seven feet of clearance uh, for any of the scopes. So there's no danger of the building coming open, a scope, a scope got stuck in the, in the wrong position. There's no danger of that uh, happening at all. But to house that, you can see on the left, we built uh, a, a slab that would hold the, the 25 by 35 building that we put on this. And a couple of other things you can't really tell from this picture, but as we were doing our research, a lot of the sites that we looked at um, and the, had the wiring configuration wasn't quite up to our standards. So what we did is plumb this whole slab with conduit. So at the base of each of the nine pier sites, we have four electrical outlets and two internet uh, access connections. Um, and that keeps our floor extremely clean. There's no danger of if someone else is in setting up their scope that they're going to trip over your wires and, and do a lot of damage to your site. Uh, and this was a little bit different, different than what we had, had uh, started with. Uh, the other thing that we have since had taken out, uh, to Lloyd's point, this was you know, a learn in process, learn as you go on the job education. Because when you think about it, there's I couldn't really find anyone on the planet that I could call and say, hey, how do you move your building? So we, uh, we figured this out a lot as we went. So if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, that's a picture of the building in full open position. The, the wood frame that you see is basically stem walls to keep uh, uh, tumbleweeds and dust and, and wind off of uh, the equipment while the building is open. And uh, we've run a lot of our wiring. So in addition to the wiring in the floor, we have outlets around all of the walls. We initially had a warm room. Uh, as, as Lloyd pointed out, we, we, there was some old school thinking going into this that had to completely change. Um, because as we got to this, we, we thought about the fact that, you know, people aren't going to be out there a lot working. They're going to come and set it up if they're bringing their own scope. And then they'll come when they uh, leave the, the facility in a year or two, three years, whatever. But there was no need for the, for the warm room. So we ended up taking that out as well. Um, and so each of the piers within the slab uh, are completely isolated, they're wrapped and isolated for vibration. Um, but what we have noticed is um, the minimum depth and breadth of the, the concrete in this pad is seven to eight inches. So we, we really, there's no vibration of this. If there were any, the only time that you would feel it is when the building is open in itself. And uh, it's an electric engine, and it moves very smoothly. And you can, even when you're standing in there, you almost can't hear it opening. So, uh, very smooth roll, no vibration. So we, we have none of those issues to deal with. And then in the bottom right, this was just taken a, a couple of weeks ago uh, with one of our uh, safety uh, security cameras inside. 
you can see the, the scopes and we were able to capture a, a shooting star in the background. But you get a feel from that picture of uh, the quality of skies that we have out there and, uh, and the, uh, the site in operation. You know, I would add a couple. Go ahead, Bruce. Sorry. I ask if there's any questions. I haven't seen any yet, but Great. guys, feel free to ask them. I'll I'll add a couple points too, um, just to go back. Um, I, the important point about the conduit is uh, there are there are dual conduits from each site, one that, that isolate data and uh, power. Right. And that that's often a question, and. Um, I, I believe that's probably an airplane up there. Uh, I got up to the shooting star. We actually have a, another star that we turned, or another camera we turned on during the Perseids that caught just tons of them, uh, which is pretty cool out there. So that's that's the finished product uh, from the outside looking in. We have the the view you're looking is is uh, pretty much due east, and uh, Albuquerque would be, you know out of the screen down to the left, uh, 96K uh, kilometers, and uh, Santa Fe would be up and to your left, uh, half that distance. And there's a little town called Las Vegas off to the right of the screen, so um, it catches everybody uh, off guard that they think you're that close to Vegas. Uh, it's hey, Vegas. <laughs> and Lloyd, let me point out a couple of things on this, this picture as well. If you look down the right side of the building you it's a little difficult to see but you see uh, some brackets there at the bottom um, again for precaution uh, the rollers that we put we offset so there's no sway back and forth that the wind is blowing when we're open or after we're open but then we also put these uh, these support brackets along the side that are all on rollers and they're down they're every uh, two or three feet down each side so if there is any uh, and there's a metal plate that, that extends out over that so if there's any wind blowing uh, those minimize or almost eliminate any rocking or, or the possibility of the thing uh, blowing off the track, so to speak. And then if you look just to the left of the building in the front, that's uh, that's our power coming in and all of our uh, weather station, sky eye camera, SQM, everything uh, uh, is mounted right there and runs through conduit into the inside of the building. And we'll show you some of those reports in, in just a minute. Yeah, I have a couple of questions for you real quick. Cool. Yes. Um, first of all, what's your typical seeing running? Yeah, the seeing, um, we don't have a seeing monitor. Um, that fell outside of the budget. Um, the best I could do um, at, for comparison is I, I, um, I imaged at another remote site that's fairly well known uh, for all of 2014. And I had, what I was able to do was compare uh, same time frame of year, same optics, same mount, same everything, same target. You know, you can run it through some fix and site tools and get some sense of um, FWHMs and some other statistics, eccentricity, and so on. And the uh, the other site measures about five to eight percent better, meaning FWHMs are slightly smaller. And I would say that. Um, you know, on that target at that time of year, uh, which is which is roughly a little bit earlier this year, the thing is essentially the same. It's it's almost a rounding error if you leave those tools. That doesn't make it doesn't um, take the place of a DMM or any other kind of seeing monitor. But I would say too that if you if you're looking for a number, I would say we are easily below two most of the time, meaning in uh, uh, between uh, January and June, and then we have we have a North American monsoon. Every site has their issues, and like I said, I've done this at two different sites for over a year at each, about a year at each, and we have a North American monsoon that's you know late summer to early autumn. Um, the other place I worked at has you know its own challenges as well with. Uh, uh, well, that, I will say that's one of the reasons I pulled out of the other site because their monsoon season went from three months to eight months. It seemed like um, it, uh, it had become almost unending as their weather deteriorated dramatically from historical levels. Yeah. So I was just curious if you were far enough north to uh, 
maybe mitigate some of those effects that they suffered down there in the Lincoln Forest. Yeah, we we I would say we were we I mean we definitely two things I know is the cactus bloomed um, this year and the locals are shocked by it. And second is uh, not in this photograph you can see on the screen, but weeks ago we had one of those black-eyed Susan. They look like uh, look like sunflowers. We had those things seven feet tall. And again, the locals, the natives there, if you will, had, had never seen that in their lifetimes. So this was an aberrant year. And I said a trend, you know, it's an aberrant year. There's a little El Nino stuff going on. I would say we have really tough weather um, uh, in July and August and in early, early September. That being said, we started operating one of the systems every clear night on August 3rd. And we have imaged every clear night since then and collected about 165 hours of, of, of uh, total light frames. So I, the way I look at it is, you know, we, we have this monsoon as a fact of life. Good news is, from a time perspective, it happens on the shortest nights of the year. Uh, the other good news is uh, the building is fully autonomous. And, and the systems, depending if you're running your own or however it's being run, they can be near, nearly fully autonomous as well. The building will open when it's clear, period. If you choose to use that time, which I think you should, you, you can make, make use of it. So, you know, we were still able to get 160 hours in our worst time of year. Uh, and I would, I would peg the seeing, I mean, if you ask me for a number back to that, I, I think we get, we get too easily uh, if you measure. Uh, in the winter, like say uh, November, December, January is among the best times, and it's probably below that. Uh, but relative to the site, other place I used, the downside to the other place, again, and they have wonderful, I'm not going to disparage them one bit, but there's a humidity and a dew issue that we have to deal with that, that we don't have. So there's trade offs, obviously. Yeah, the average, uh, average humidity. Where we are is uh, 25 percent or below, probably nine months out of the year, uh, which is probably I know the area you're talking about down in the Lincoln National uh, Forest in that area. And my experience in the 15 years I've been out there is during our our uh, monsoon season, which to Lloyd's point was a little worse. It was uh, an abnormality because of the El Nino effect, uh, but during that period. Um, there seems to be a line just south of Santa of uh, Albuquerque, where you know the the weather coming in off of the the west southwest uh, in the Pacific coming up through Mexico kind of peters out about in that area. Again, it was a little different this this year, uh, but to Lloyd's point, on in, in a normal cycle, that that's usually over by first week of September, so June through September. Hi, this is Eric. Uh, do you have an estimate of how many imageable nights you're going to have a year? Yeah, we conservatively, you know, we've been able to count actually, you know, and we we take out about um, be conservative. We take out 60 days to account for monsoonal effects, and then um, take out other days which are just you know not going to go your way. The number is is north of 200 and south of 300. If you look at some of the statistics from the state, um, and this we found this in our research, uh, they, they said average about 300. Our experience to date, to Lloyd's point, has been somewhere north of 200 but south of 300. Any other questions? Um. What kind of, uh, I'm going to start off with my questions. I actually have a lot of them, so, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you one. And I don't know if this is the end of your presentation or if you wanted to, uh, I know you have some other stuff, but uh, support-wise, are you going to be getting to that? What happens when stuff goes wrong? Yeah, why don't we address it now that it's top of mind. So we have we have support, um, you know, it's critical. I, I live in Atlanta where I sit right now, and Bruce is at his part-time home in Charlotte right now. Um, so what's happening out of Deep Sky West? Um, we have 
multiple levels and different kinds of support. Uh, the, the most critical one is our our guide David Bradshaw, who lives at the bottom of the mesa. He uh, he's an amateur amateur amateur. Um, by night, he's uh, our our main line of technical support, if you will. He also, uh, by day, is a security and surveillance camera expert. So he has clients all over Albuquerque and, and Santa Fe. So uh, very similar to that I've, that I've experienced in other places. You, know, you can call up David and say, I need you to go up, go up top uh, this evening. Call me. There's a phone inside. Uh, call me, and I need you to you know, fix a rotator or, you know, tweak a polar alignment or what have you. He has the ability to do most of those things, all those sorts of things. I've had him work on collimation and so on. We'll use a combination of FaceTime or just phone, depending, or and, and or whoever is working with him can watch it on the internal surveillance cameras. So he's there most every night, but certainly if I call him or whoever needs him, call him to show up. But well, he's fairly capable. And we have another fellow who lives just outside, just in the next parcel over. He's more of a uh, ground security type of fellow. He can do some very basic things, but he um, keeps an eye out on stormy nights. He knows, you know, the status of the building, if there's a strange car in the neighborhood, off of the private drive, which connects our two properties. He's aware of that. And then finally, we have the, uh, the electricians and the metal workers who together Designed the uh, custom relay system that controls the automation, and and did and the other guy who did all the metal work. Um, we can have them on site, you know, in a, in about an hour or so if we have something really bad happen. Uh, really bad meaning we had a, you know, 12 hour power failure. We wanted the guy to go up to see if everything was okay with the systems, things like that. So we have the support pulled together pretty well. And Bruce is a part-time resident as well. He's there, you know. Half yeah, I'm probably on site a couple of weeks a month. I, I uh, work out of the uh, Dallas area, so uh, on the weekend I fly over, and uh, and I'm able to work off uh, out of that site uh, on average about two two weeks out of the month. We're, we're also going to talk about uh, in in just a moment all of the redundancy we have built into the system for uh, you know closing and monitoring and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, uh, I'll show you guys. We, we actually had a, a friend of ours locally to produce this video. It's, it's two and a half minutes or so. I want you to want to make sure everyone gets a sense for, you know, what it looks like. So uh, you won't be able to hear the uh, audio track that he custom did for us. It's a little bit dramatic anyway, but here, here goes. This can display in 4K, but I want to save your bandwidth in mind too. So I'm going to make a pause right here. If you can follow my cursor, this kind of straight line of trees here, that marks the northern border of the property, which goes off the screen. It comes back in right about following my cursor. Uh, this is the western border out to the edge of these trees and then down the main access road, which is a private drive. Uh, it comes all the way over to about here. So this is this is roughly, uh, believe it or not, that's roughly a 35 acre square. The residence you'll see in a second is right in that area. And everything on everything on this? Everything on this side of that line is national forest for 12 miles driving up to it. So at this point, the approach is almost due south. North. Oh, yeah, the approach is south. I'm sorry, you're right. And now the approach is uh, obviously downward and, and due west. He's I'm going to pause here really quickly. There's a resonance, and I think Bruce is actually standing on the roof. <laughs> popular spot because you can just step right up on it. And in the back here, you see some of the works. This this is a, I don't know, what's that, Bruce? Four feet across this particular concrete yeah. pylon? Yeah, it's a um, pylon that houses the... It goes the, down in the ground about eight feet. 
attached to that, affixed to the top of that, is the actual motor that actuates the building. And along the back is a long steel rail that's supported with two other, uh, they're now steel, we just switched these out, but they support the tail of the building that pulls it backwards from the center. So there's no torsional issues going on there. So here, as it so happened, because of our timing, this is 30 minutes before dusk. You can see the long shadows. So everything the building is doing here it does on its own based on what it sees from the, the Davis Weather Station, the Sky Alert, Cloud Sensor, and uh, other timing cues. So M1 Oasis is running this thing. And um, uh, this obviously is just for a dramatic impact with the lighting on the inside. One thing to notice is to note is that we use M1 uh, to drive this, but it's a heavily customized instance of M1. None of these systems, no single system on the floor has control of the building. The building is completely independent of that. So it monitors weather conditions, darkness conditions, uh, and other things to decide whether or not it's safe to open. And there are certain failure conditions that we monitor. So in the event of internet failure, electrical failure, uh, actual rain, which is a triple redundant system, if for some reason the roof is not closed because of the failure of the M1, um, there are two optical sensors that will, upon the first drop of rain, they will trigger a closure of the building. Uh, the power is redundant um, with two inline uh, UPSs plus uh, power and surge conditioner outside of the building. That's for lightning arresting, uh, brownouts, and other things. If any of those conditions happen, that triggers an automatic closure. And of course, you have the basic weather closures um, humidity over a certain amount, wind speed over a certain amount. And every one of those conditions is reported to our, all of our kind of a support structure, if you will. So Bruce gets it, I get it, and uh, two or three other people get it. They get emails and or texts um, as to what's going on. The building's not opening due to weather, or the building's closing due to weather, or closing due to a power failure. Um, we have enough power to run all the systems on the floor um, all night long and actually for several days, and we chose not to do that uh, simply out of, out of an abundance of caution. If you have a power failure, then you need to get to the root of it. And uh, missing a night, a night of imaging is not worth any other potential failure that might have led to the failure of power in the first place. So we have a fairly conservative approach to it. Um, over the course of a night, if there's a weather interrupt, um, we demand at least a an hours long period of clear before reopening. The one systems on the floor are notified. We're reopening. Go ahead and continue doing what you're doing. Some of that, some of your ability to continue an energy session is limited by the software that you have. ACP is very easy about reopening after or restarting after a failure. Uh, CCDAP, if it's very cloudy or worse, you're you're done for the night unless you restart. Uh, Lloyd, one other thing. Our, our, our one example, uh, cut and paste some of the critical uh, uh, instrumentation that I look at on a daily basis. We all look at on a daily basis to understand what's happening. And on this particular day, uh, the cloud graph is showing you it's a pretty clear night. If you see sky temperatures during the day, and this was already in, well into the imaging session, but sky temperatures during the day of less than about eight degrees C, that's going to be a good night. And the sky differential, so uh, minus 11, minus 16, uh, gives you a minus 26. Anything over, uh, anything less than negative 20 C is indicative of a clear night. And you can kind of see it on the all sky camera down on the lower right that it's a clear night. I'll show you a better picture of that. And on this particular day, you notice on the right the uptime of 146 hours. That had been 146 hours since I rebooted the M1 and the other control system. Uh, the record I've had here before I've 
rebooted for one reason or another. There's uh, been over 630 hours of continuous operation without any change to the system. So when I do do a reboot, it's, it's because it hasn't been done in a while, and then there's no harm to foul in doing it. Just sort of gets everything refreshed. If, you, if we zoomed in on that all sky cam, this all sky cam is pretty cool, but it also has a quirk that we're working through. Our provider of this is gives a super super duper service, and he calls me um, almost on a daily basis some weeks. But you can clearly see the Milky Way, and I'll tell you that this particular image through the sky cam is only mediocre. The polycarbonate that covers it that seals it, um, is sensitive to heat, and there's some kind of a chemist among us can tell us, but there's some kind of reaction that goes on, and it requires fairly constant cleaning to keep it clear. But even so, you can see the Milky Way and this really big, fat, defective pixels. That is not a light. Um, I had to argue with various people to say, to prove that is indeed not a light. Um, and this screen is actually one of the systems on the floor, uh, an FSQ-106 on a mighty mount, which is kind of what it looked like. If you notice um, the time stamps, 1844 local, it was just before it was ready to do uh, evening sky flats. And, uh, you know, I, I probably started that session before I went to work that morning. I just walked away and will do everything else all by itself. It's pretty cool. So how does it work, this Deep Sky West? How does it work? Well, you know, we, we started this, like I said, it was just going to be a dome for Lloyd, and then it grew into this, this much bigger I, idea. And we said, well, you know, there's a couple things you can do here. You can have systems for people who, uh, you know, some of our offshore customers, we have people on, represented on, you know, from people from, we have an Italian living in Brazil and a Brazilian living in Italy and people, you know, in the UK and Australia and Germany. Some of those folks, you know, want access to maybe just this hemisphere or to better skies than they have in the, from the metro area. So we altered our plan a little bit from just standard hosting, which I had the customer of another service and thought that worked just fine. We said, well, you know, for people who don't want to move their equipment, can or would otherwise be a pain in the neck. We'll just put them on a big team on one of our own scopes. And we have, you know, a couple, just two, in there, wherein we can say to them, look, if you want access, you pay a low monthly or a low annual fee, then you and this team of in individual imagers can have access to all the data, all the time, every night. There's no point systems. You just have to decide what you're going to image. And at certain, in certain focal lengths, with an FSQ, which is a fine scope, a QSI 8300 chip, there in the infinite universe, there actually are a finite number of targets. And I think, you know, some of us who've done this for a while, you know, you've actually gone through the typical targets and sees them or two or three or ten. You know, you've pretty much done it all. You can do variations on the theme. But my point is, really about democratically selecting targets. It is a finite list, actually, of interesting things. Uh, we don't typically do very many open clusters or individual stars or things like that, or things that are too small for the field of view. Um, the larger platform completely changes that. But there are many more targets. You could spend you know, a couple of months on just different sections of something like the Heart Nebula or Soul Nebula. You get my point aside from doing uh, um, hard to reach galaxies unless you have a longer instrument. So we set it up so that if you want to be on a team, you're all going to get the same data. You have rights to your final images belong to you. You can sell them, give them away, publish them. We don't care. The raw data stays with us. You own, you get the raw data. Ownership of it stays with us to try to prohibit any kind of unusual distribution of it. But you know when people pay for something, they don't just typically give it away. Um, the traditional model is for you to, you know, rent a space, set up your equipment, run it. Either you alone or you and a few of your best friends who together can put together a killer system as a group that you may not have been able to do otherwise. And we tried to price that in a way that would be attractive. It is, uh, 
is not the lowest rate you can get. Um, it's not the highest rate that you might be asked to pay at some places around us in our state and, and other adjacent states. So it's uh, actually the price point has a story. The price point is modeled after our initial team at another site. We had seven people. They said, if you have a team of seven people, you can drive the cost of imaging to $100 a month per person. And if you go back to that other chart and think about this acquaintance of ours who had 40 plus grand tied up in the system and he imaged 20 nights a year, well, that first year that he imaged, every one of those 20 nights cost him a lot of money. So I'm telling you, you can do that for $100 a month and you will get many more nights. So anyway, we worked the uh, economics out to a way that we thought was affordable, and we've had quite a bit of uptake on that. We've also run into a few interesting angles on it, meaning, you know, there's a, I've seen the arguments, I usually don't join them, I read quite a bit, it's just like the next guy. But there are people that have a perspective, well, if you, you know, remote imaging is cheating, you need to be responsible for it. your own acquisition, in your own vicinity, whether you get in the car and drive for three hours and set up for an hour or two and stay up all night, you need to do that in order for it to be authentic. Uh, and I just have a fundamental disagreement with that perspective. Um, I think that once you master guiding and pointing and tracking and all of those things it takes to acquire a target, after that, Acquisition plays very little of a, of a role, in my opinion, in the quality of a final image. I'm not saying you've got to focus it, you've got to, you've got to have good polar line, and et cetera. But once you do that, it's you against the data. It's you against the data and the skills and tools and techniques that you've picked up along the way. No one gets a prize for acquisition, especially acquisition under four arcs, arc second skies, uh, under a five million person light dome like I live over here in Atlanta. So we've tried to separate acquisition from processing. And so you may have a dozen people with the same data every day from the same scope. And, and there's another attitude that, that comes out or perspective, if you will, that says, well, I don't, you know, I want to be unique. I don't want to have the same target and the same framing and the same object as everyone else. And then those of us who looked at a lot of images almost on a daily basis, Again, there's a finite number of targets. People frame them in fairly typical ways. In a galaxy one, you're going from left to left or right or vice versa. Um, so, and then the last part of the sermon on that, and I will stop, is um, I think a lot of us, a lot of people, not, not everyone, a lot of us, you know, we publish on our own websites, we publish on Astrobin, and, you know, so, you know, you get some level of recognition for having produced a great image, and it feels good and all that, but we've, we've had to push through some attitudes that say, well, I don't want to compete with the same guy or with the same target, the same image. I actually take a contrarian point of view. If, you, if you're truly going to be judged on the quality of the image, and it's arguable whether or not a place like Ashton provides that level of scrutiny, uh, but if you think it does, then get on there with the same data with everybody else and see what really you can do. So, but, of course, all those points of views are slanted in favor of this whole idea that we're promoting here, but uh, why wouldn't they be? Hey, Lloyd, one last point to that. that so, uh, current you... status of what we have is um, we've been in what I call a, a go-live or an operational status since August 3rd. We produced images all through the winter during testing. So you've probably seen some of them. And we still have space available for, space available for the people I call the joiners who just want to get on a production system and either augment data that are getting at home or get data that's of higher quality. Um, so we have space available for them. And we have space available for people who want to start a team, you know, from the ground up and, and host, you know, with a, with a new outfit, but with uh, quite a bit of experience and quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of a unique, I think, facility that's got state-of-the-art stuff all in it. I, I didn't mention this before. For the folks that are on our, our start our joiners, if you will, you know, we have minimum in imaging standards that we start with. 
every LRGB target will be 16 by 900 minimum. And depending on the target, we may go 32, 48, or even longer on the luminance on an LRGB target. Um, some may think overkill, but with an abundance of clear sky, uh, more data is better than less. And on a narrowband target, the similar standard at 16 by 1800 across the board. And again, depending on the target, we might just go bicolor, or we might go tricolor for narrowband, and for the weaker channels, we might go a little bit longer. And there's some of our group who do amazing things with surprisingly little data. Well, when they're with us, they get a lot of data, period. And uh, one shameless plug is uh, we find ourselves with, uh, if you can believe this, with an extra mount. Um, it is one of mine that I'm leaving there or I'm going to sell, but I will leave it there uh, in the event someone finds themselves with everything they need except a quality, except a quality mount. First come, first serve. It's uh, there for the next team who wants to build up around it. Uh, other than that, I will sell it and buy a new camera. Thanks. There's nothing wrong with it. I, I guess I should add that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. We replaced it with a, a different mount. And so now it's uh, somewhat surplus. Our contact information is on the right. Those are our personal email addresses. You can use our main one creatively called DeepSkyWest at DeepSkyWest.com. And uh, that will reach both of us no problem. And uh, with four minutes left on the time, that is the last slide that we have, which is a picture of our website. Free to go out there, go out and get some free data, which is uh, some luminance of a uh, course that I did earlier in the year just for kicks. Uh, it's enough data to produce a decent little image. Thank so, you, Lloyd. Um, that's it. Thank you, Lloyd. I see Bruce wanted to make a comment, but I do want to say, Isaac, I'm going to ask your question for you. It's I have a lot of questions that are going to be revolving around a lot of that stuff. But Bruce, you go ahead and uh, make that comment you wanted to. Oh, uh, just one last thing. Uh, we've also created a blog site for all of our team members uh, that uh, they share a lot of uh, tips, techniques, and and to date, it's been an extremely supportive group of people. Mm -hmm. We've got some. Uh, uh, amazing imagers on this, people that are well known within within the community and uh, everybody is uh, more than open and willing to uh, share idea, ideas uh, and techniques and uh, uh, it's unique I think to what we're doing here. That's, that's good to hear. Um, Bruce. Lloyd, are you still hear us? Or are you having trouble? Here? I don't know if Lloyd can hear us anymore. Lloyd, do you hear us? Hello. Lloyd, do you hear us? We might have lost him for one reason or another. Uh, I'll get him back. Uh, I think he's coming back on. Um, hey. When did I crap out? <laughs> we hear you now. You're back. No, after you finished the presentation, then we jumped over to Bruce and... When we hear you now. Um, question. Uh, a particular software that you favor, or do you require to pe people to use a specific type of software uh, if they're coming in there? I guess for the full peer plan? Hold on just a minute. Uh, he's having trouble. Okay. Lloyd, we've lost your audio. Really? When did it go off? Long okay, time? now we hear you. You're back. You're back. Oh, You're back. Well, oh. Let me see if it works over here. Yeah, uh, you're back. Can you hear us? I'm back. You're back. We can hear you. I hear nothing. You don't hear us. I got nothing. Um, let's see. What we can do is we can type those questions right into the chat, and we can hear you. So you can just uh, you can just answer the question that should pop up right now. And I don't know if you see that question yeah, there. Yeah, nothing, man. Oh, really? Okay. Sure. What? Okay. I'm going to hang up and come back. Leave call and come back. Okay. 
All right, so uh, while we try and get this sorted out, I do want to mention that Alex is presenting next week, Alex McConaughey, and his presentation is A Loaf of Bread, A Jug of Milk, and Pix Insight. And it's kind of a different way of looking at Pix Insight. It doesn't have to be so difficult. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, less intimidating than it typically would be. Uh, so definitely stop by and check that out. Let's see, we have Lloyd back in. Lloyd, do you hear us? I don't think you... I hear you. Do you hear us? Does that work better? I hear you. Do you hear us? Hmm. I don't think he hears us. Nope, I don't think he hears us. Uh, now you're muted. Let's see. I don't think it would be anything in here. No, you're unmuted, full volume. So I did, uh, I, Isaac, I was holding off on asking your question because I knew he was going to pop back in here. I did see him using MaximDL on that other computer screen. Um, so I know MaximDL would be one of the allowed programs. I know typically we'll see people using a ACP. Um, Lloyd, just tell me if you hear us. I see your, do you hear us yet? I don't think he hears us. Um, so I'm going to also assume that it's Windows that they're running. Um, hey, it's Lloyd. I made it back. Lloyd, do you hear us? I do. Oh, okay. Here he is. Uh, okay, so uh, Isaac was asking, uh, were you talking about, this was a question asked earlier on, Will you be talking about software used for controlling, capturing, remoting, uh, laptops, desktops, Windows, iOS, Linux? Go ahead. Sure. Um, at the at the control at the telescope side, so at the acquisition system, I've been back and forth on this, and I actually have a preference for laptops, which is an unusual choice. Um, I, I think there was a push to use. Uh, desktops because of uh, serial port issues. You can have many of them. And so what I, what I found is that desktops, actually, they're hard to find one with a serial port and you have to add to it, number one. Number two is um, desktop screens can often get left on, so we make sure those are plugged into uh, IP power switches so we have that controller to turn them off if it happens. Now, a laptop is just compact. You have a screen if you want to use it, or you, don't, you can or you don't have to. So that works. Um, so I'm not down with desktop so much. Um, operating system-wise, I'm a, I'm a Windows guy just because that's what I know. And uh, I've run systems on Windows 7 and Windows 8 with, with virtually no discernible difference in the driver's operations. Um, control system-wise, um, I prefer to bring systems up initially on autopilot for two reasons. First, I know it. The user interface is nice and friendly. And it makes use of... of multiple different underlying programs like you can use Maxim or you can use the camera add-on with, with SkyX. You can use Pinpoint or you can use SkyX plate solving. And for me, I think the ultimate implementation is truly with ACP. And if you've gone through to learn guiding on Maxim, which is usually the big learning curve for folks because I came from PhD too like a lot of folks, once you figure that out, what you find out is you paid six or seven hundred dollars for a program that does tons of different things, and all you use it for is guiding and, and capture. But if you know it, when you make the ACP transition, it's much simpler uh, because that's what ACP uses. That's, that's my take there. Focus Max, the free one, works fine for me. The new one I've used, it works fine just as well. Um, but Maxim, SkyX Professional, Autopilot, great UI, fantastic support, um, and a lively support group make that an easy choice to start out. I understand SGP is popular and, and common. I haven't personally run into CCD Commander too much, but um, I'm sure SGP does a fine job as well. Yeah, actually, a lot of us use SGP. I would miss SGP if I had to uh, <laughs> if I had to leave it. Uh, but um, but I, on another note, I see you you have a, an AP mount, so there's no mat requirement for software BISC mounts. I'll assume. I'm sorry, there's no what kind of requirement? Uh, I think for a while some of the other sites required software BISC mounts because of the homing oh, capability. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, um, I have seen that. Um, you know, 
that is a support that's a support cost question, right? People are going to lose their mount and they'd rather have it on a home mount. And having crashed some AP mounts myself, um, that's kind of my worst fear is waking up and the mount's crashed. It is the the second fear is that annoying sound when you you know guide start fades. The second sound that I despise. So um, I've run both AP and BIS mounts out there. Uh, I have crashed my AP mount, and it's always due to user error. Always. Um, if you set it properly and you sync it and you follow procedure, there's a rare day that you crash that mount. And with APCC in place. Um, it gives you a hardware stop, or I mean, excuse me, a software-based stop as opposed to a physical stop. But I have no requirement, we have no requirement that it has to be a disk mount or an ascension mount. Um, I think most of the people that would look to go remote are going to, by and large, be BISC or AP folks. Mm -hmm. And if not, if not, we, we, don't, we don't snob and discriminate. We just have to figure out ways for it to work. Mm -hmm. Can so, I throw my two cents in on this, Adam? Go right ahead. All right. First of all, I, I, I was, I've always not used a laptop because of cold weather performance, number one. When it gets really, really cold up there in the mountains at night, that laptop can suffer. Two, a laptop monitor actually can be a problem and make everybody else in the observatory hate you if you leave it on. <laughs> um, they'll be screaming like a stuck pig. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, I have mine on a digital logger, so my monitor is always powered off unless I manually switch the monitor on. Um, the um, I would say on mounts, from my experience, having used both, first of all, all the newer AP mounts have homing on them, and I think that's kind of a critical feature. Uh, I have accidentally left tracking on before and ended up with a telescope crashing into a pier, which isn't a fun thing. Um, but I'm going to throw a plug in for ACP over um, any of the other programs, and I'll tell, I'll say one reason why after four years of experience, and that's the level of support that Bob Denny gives when you have a problem. When you're remote, there's nothing more nightmarish than trying to figure out what's not working together correctly in all of the software programs, and it does happen. I'm I'm suffering a, a minor problem right now. Bob Denny will, um, I had actually, I had the text from SBIG, I'm dealing with an AOX problem, and Bob Denny working together two days solid, diagnosing the system remotely and figuring it out and fixing it for me, and that's just a problem you don't want to have when your system's real, real far away. Now. John Smith makes an excellent program. I have nothing against CCD Autopilot. I own CCD Navigator, CCD Inspector, CCD Stack. John Smith is a great guy, but Bob Denny has really stepped up with remote control and login on your system now, and it can fix pretty much just about everything that I can't figure out because technically I'm a, well, believe it, the insults to myself. But, uh, so I'll give a plug from four years of experience. I would definitely stick with ACP. And um, hardware uh, drive space is a constant problem, especially when you're using a larger chip format camera. You're going to eat up a lot of hard space real, real quick. And even though I download a lot of stuff to Dropbox and try to get it off of there, um, I typically – I'm always fighting for space. Um, if you're using an AP mount, especially if you get encoders, it does a ton of logging. That um, if you don't keep that stuff cleaned up, um, you'll you'll fill a hard drive up in an instant. Now I know laptops have gotten much better with hard drive space, but um, I've actually hooked up an external drive just to archive stuff to, yeah, to, yeah. to make it easier for me. Um, but let's see, what else was we going to address? Um, oh, camera, uh, remote control cameras. It looks like you guys have got a pretty good setup of a pretty good view of all of the telescopes. Um, do you have the availability to put a tel A lot of times you want to see what's going on with your system. Um, you know, if something's a wire, if you've got a cord wrap problem or something like that, do you have the availability for like fisheye cameras or night cameras to, to you know be able to zoom in on your system so yeah, that yeah. you can uh, 
kind of help remotely diagnose it yourself? Yeah, we do. They're actually uh, inside of the uh, the building. There are there are seven cameras. You know, I started out with the Bosch Starlight cameras, which work fine. They work a lot like advertised. Uh, I had reliability problems with two of them, and they're expensive. Um, they're approaching a thousand dollars a piece. So um, our support guy, who I mentioned, does um, security camera surveillance work. He built. The cameras for us, custom built, and the ones that are in there now are prototypes. So they, um, what we were able to do, given the difference in expense, is each telescope site has a camera that is trained on it. So everyone has their own, and uh, then you have the ones that cover wider fields of view. Some are better at, in the day, some are better at night, but they, you have multiple views. So there's seven outside view or inside views today. And uh, it's been a, you know, this guy was a godsend because uh, he does it for a living and it worked out perfectly for us. And uh, I would second your motion on Bob Denny and ACP or your, your perspective. Uh, John Smith has never dialed into my system under any circumstance, even though I would like for him to have done it. Uh, Bob calls me even to this day saying, I found in something you logged a year ago. Was that ever <laughs> resolved? And uh, he's come on my system and written code on the spot or altered it as needed. So I, I, I couldn't disagree with more. And the scheduler functionality is worth its weight in gold. Um, because you literally can load it up with targets that won't get imaged for a year or months from now. And it will optimize those. And I mean, you've read the specs, but to actually use it and see it work, you know, it works perfectly. You get a report every day of what failed, if something failed for some reason or another. You just resubmit it and you and you go on about your business. Autopilot requires to make sure you're going to get not waste the night. It requires nearly daily. It does require daily intervention at a minimum. <coughs> and then we've we've kind of tried to solve the uh, storage problem, you know, with external. You know, we'll put an external terabyte drive on the main on the uh, capture systems. We do a backup locally, and then everyone in our network, you know. Uses Google Drive. Uh, Google Drive over Dropbox because Dropbox counts shared data with you against your quota, and Google Drive does not. Yeah, that stinks about Dropbox. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it works for them. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. You know, the idea of having the data, the image taken, it drops to the local machine and backs up to the local machine, and boom, it goes out to however many people it's going to pass. Um, Lloyd, Michelle is asking, do any of the scopes on site use active or adaptive optics? Um, no. Uh, the scopes on site, the um, scopes on site and the ones that are due to come on site. So there's a couple of differences. It's not a simple yes or no. Uh, FSQ is a popular platform, so the AO is not, not needed or useful for those. Um, I, that's my understanding. I've never used one, but I understand the logic behind it. It's just not that sensitive at, at the image scale and, and at the aperture you're dealing with. The uh, We have a 14 half inch Arcos uh, on which I'm contemplating an AO for it. I'm just torn between which one to get. You, know, you, you have to decide. I, I Actually, I want a 12 micron pixel camera, uh, and you know, that pushes you to a Finger Lakes area. Uh, a Finger Lakes model, or a handful of models, Finger Lakes model. And uh, you know, I kind of like the uh, Santa Barbara cameras with a, a now proven or somewhat proven AO unit, but I can't get that 9,000 ship in one of those. So AO, uh, we could probably use it on the bigger scope and the smaller scopes. Isaac's also asking whether you will be at AIC. I had not planned on it. I've never been. It's a rite of passage I haven't yet taken. I would love to go, but uh, I doubt that uh, we will be represented there this time. Yeah, it's the wrong side of the country for me, but uh, yeah. I think a few people that have been through it will be there. Maybe a few in this room will be there. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I have a question. I, uh, I want to go with the full peer plan, right? I, I want a peer, and maybe I'll split it with a couple people, but do I actually have to visit you guys, or can I have the boxes sent right to you and have it set up? If you want us to do it, a couple things. The more important thing is 
you you're, you have to test it out at home. Mm -hmm. It has to be working before I get it, right? Well, yeah. We're not going to solve that. We can, but that's really not the plan we want to get into. We would rather also not do anything that's particularly invasive to your system. For example, we don't want to, you know, have to shim things on your mouth. We don't necessarily want to have to uh, futz with your collimation, although if we're shipping, that's sometimes a part of life. Um, just we do things to limit liability, you know, uh, across the range of sensitive equipment. But generally, if you heavily document or you test and then document with photos, you know, we know enough about how most systems go together uh, that we can do it. And after that, there's an expense issue. If I if I'm not already there, then I have to fly out. So we'll we'll figure out a way for us to cover those expenses, and it saves you what work time and travel time, et cetera. But folks who have come out, you know, they come out. I think you need to spend three days. Some people try to do it in less, but you need the day to do the physical install. You got to, you know, clear night. You're going to need a clear night to do your calibrations, focus your calibrations, V curves, whatever it is you need to do, polar alignment, etc. And then you need a, a day to ensure that it's all working properly. Now, the mm -hmm. alternative to that is it's an alternative, and one thing that gets in the way. An alternative to that is do all the physical things, especially the difficult physical things. Everything else you can do remotely. I, I, I prefer TeamViewer over any other. But I also, a little bit of an aside, I also always have an alternative remote solution. So I'll use TeamViewer and Google, uh, Chrome Remote Desktop, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, if one's not working, the other one often is. And uh, But do the physical things, and then everything else you can do from home. Right? And, and if somebody messed up a cable, you want to swap up the cable, Call up David B, David Bradshaw, and say, David, I need you on the mountain at 8:30. Boom, he'll do that. Okay. And that uh, is there a fee schedule for that? Using the this that David? Nope. Nope. Yes. We, we pay we pay David out of operating out of our operating budget. You pay a flat rate. I want you to know up front what you're going to pay. It is not going to change. You pay it one time. You walk away. If you need uh, more David than the other guy, what we try to do is be smart about it, is uh, batch up you know, two or three requests, depending on the urgency. Um, if you need him right away, he'll go right away. If there's two or three people that need the same sort of thing or need something that can wait 12 hours, and we'll do them in, in a batch. Eric is asking flat panels. Any arrangements for flat panels, or are you guys sky flat people? Um, first, first line of Defense is sky flat. Second is uh, flat panel. Um, the, we have a three by three grid. It is that scope in the center that has the biggest problem with sky flats. So what we right, or excuse me, with a flat panel, sky flat is no problem. But if you're in the center, sometimes you're obscured from a, a reasonable view of a wall. So what we've done is we put a flat panel, basically a white card, in the ceiling, right? So you can, with the ambient light that comes through the building already, you can do your flats. Actually, the building is your flat panel, which is not, that's a practice that's used in a lot of professional observatories as well. They just get the flats off the inside surface, and we've set that up. Great. Anyone else in the room have any questions? Anyone outside the room have any questions? Type them in now. Um, a reminder, Alex is up next week. And I do want to thank Lloyd for coming by. Uh, if I don't, uh, if you guys don't have questions, remember we'll end the session. So make sure you ask them now. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so that AP 1100 seems like an opportunity for anyone out there that uh, is looking to get a peer. Hey, I got Keller still still trying to sell his uh, M uh, his uh, what the hell is that thing that it's an, uh, an ME one. Emmy that's still sitting in my garage. If anybody's interested, he told me. I talked to him the other day on email. He told me that and his camera was sitting on the floor of your garage. <laughs> but the uh, the AP will be for sale sometime down the road. But all I'm saying is, you know, I'll keep it there. If that's going to be the last piece of your puzzle, then mm -hmm. you've got that. And the peers we use are custom made on site. You know, to order for each individual. So they're. They're um, quarter-inch steel made on site, and the uh, the uh, bolt pattern is fit is uh, such that it'll fit AP or uh, paramounts out of the box. If you need a custom thing, then, then uh, Matt will build it on site. 
Very, very interesting. So you've got a couple options. You can get in on the cheap and share the peer with uh, a few people, six people, seven people. Uh, get attack. Get uh, what was it? A, a FSQ one hundred one hundred six. You got one hundred six. You got a one hundred six. Yep. And then the RC. And you've got a fourteen and a half inch uh, carbon truss RC that'll have you know half a dozen or more people on it. You guys pay a flat rate. Um, you know, and that's it. You collaborate on what you want to image, and we make it happen. Other than that, you're you're you know a duo or a quad or a trio. You have your own equipment. You do your own thing, and uh, all we do is keep it safe for you. Hey, Adam. Yes, Josh. Go ahead. Uh, Bruce got kicked out of the room, and he's trying to get back in, but he oh, can't get man. back in. Can I ask, uh, I'm going to pick the last person in the room, which was Sean. Sean, would you mind jumping out of the room? Thank you, Sean. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Bruce, if you can see us, uh, how do we get a hold of Bruce just to tell him to jump back in? Oh, I'll be emailing back right now. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, we can come up with a few things to chat about uh, while, we're, uh, while we're waiting. Um, yeah, Tolga never made it back in as well. We'll see what this email is. Tolga, who won our image of the week, never. <laughs> I think he's coming back in now. Um, my apologies. Uh, yeah, so uh, good skies. Uh, two hundred over two hundred clear nights a a year. That's that's crazy. Yeah, it gets crazy when when I have uh, I have my own FSQ sitting on the floor next to a production FSQ which is on the mighty mount. I use a Mach one, um, and we have the Arcos. When those three are blasting data, uh, it gets it gets hectic. Mm -hmm. So having fiber on the ground uh, makes a huge difference. Yeah, one of the, the, having that many clear nights a year really uh, changes the way you look at it. You might as well shoot a bunch of tar er, a bunch of hours on a particular target. You might as well hit 20 hours, 40 hours on a target because uh, it it it, it kind of stinks to say it, but you are limited with your targets up there uh, when you're using an FSQ particularly. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's a finite there's a finite number of, of targets and. You can do some things that are obscure, a couple of dark nebula, and you know I've tried to shoot Hans from my yard in Atlanta. I tried to shoot NGC uh, 1333. You can't do it. You just can't do it. Now I'm, I've been laying on 1333. It hasn't even uh, topped out yet, and uh, I've been banging away at it for two months. I take at least six, seven frames every night at the end of the session. Whatever I'm doing, I hit that. So I probably have. 30, 15 minute frames. I haven't even tried to process it yet. I'm just going to, that's going to be my project for this season. Uh, when it's done, I'll have an absurd amount of data. We did a target on our team last year that we got, it ended up with 107 hours. It's different than some of the crowd type sourcing that, you know, a couple of you guys are on some of those projects now. Um, it's different than that, but, you know, we have unlimited time. The, the, I remember going out to the woods by myself. It's dark. It's cold. I'm in a hurry. I want to get this done, and you're kind of almost frantic. Uh, now I just look at my. I'll use my phone, and I'll start a session. And I go to sleep. Okay. Yeah. It seems like a dream sometimes that you can just uh, sit back, get your data, and then process it in your free time. Uh, <laughs> And I don't know if Bruce told you this story, but uh, one of the representatives from representatives from the um, Albuquerque um, Astronomy Club came up, saw us online. He came up and he wanted to check it out. I was actually going to see one of my clients in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's about a two-hour drive from my house. And uh, the guy came up and, and wanted to see the building open during the day. So I, I'm driving. Stupid, I know. But I pop out my phone. Cops probably think I'm texting. Well, I clicked a couple of buttons on my M1 to go, and I opened the building for him. I said, I want you to know I'm doing 75 miles an hour in the middle of Tennessee making that building open. So we have those, you know, like we said, the technology is there. And, and, and all you guys have killer technology uh, wherever you have it. Unfortunately, some of this group has it in places that's just not great. 
you know, once I fell out of love with the hardware and messing around with it, I, I haven't missed it being in my backyard. I still have a 24-inch pier back there. Uh, I, I got to get someone with a truck to pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you charted the uh, number of clear uh, clear nights and uh, how much money you're spending per imaging session or per image or however you want to look at it. Yeah. And uh, the other way to look at it is you have this particular gear and you're I'm in Scranton, PA, like right next to Scranton, PA. You're in at, you're near Atlanta. Uh, some people are in New Jersey. Told is mentioning he didn't even know he pick, we picked his image, but he's in New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, sometimes when you get to a, a specific point, you've got an expensive camera, an expensive scope, an expensive mount. It's almost too good of an, a, a piece of equipment to have in this sky. It's better to get it in darker skies, and it's just uh, a couple trillion electrons away over the internet so yeah I mean I agree with you when if you if you nailed your automation and like I said earlier I started out with automated you know meridian flips and the whole bit um, if you've nailed that and you're a hundred feet away then you have to get over the mental hurdle of now it's a thousand miles away. And, and it's and it's not inexpensive but it also you know the first time I looked for a place to go remote I was looking at close to eighteen hundred dollars a month you know Mm -hmm. Watch your own little hut, and it's going to be three thousand dollars a month. So you know, I love this, but not that much. Um, and, you know, so we pulled together a team of seven people, and you know, effective cost was one hundred twenty-five bucks a month, and we produced forty-eight complete images in that year. You know, my average integration time is fifteen point seven hours. So I, I can't think of another. I'm I'm so used to it now that I I, I can't go back. All right, well, um, I think that's pretty much it. We haven't got Bruce back into the room. I don't know if he's still trying. I did get that email from him, but... Uh, yeah, I'll call him at his house in a minute. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I do want to thank you, Lloyd, for coming by and telling us all about your site. Uh, definitely a great presentation. There were a lot of people in the room, so I think uh, a lot of people got uh, a lot of the info they were looking for. And, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe we'll be talking in the future about where I'm going to put my peer. Fantastic. That's the conversations I love to have. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming by. And uh, for all the guys in the, this live room here, you're welcome to stay in the room for a little bit. But uh, everyone out there, I'm going to say thank you, and we'll see you next week. Take care.